Hi, I'm Glenn Caston, and uh, my cohort here is Matt Landis, and we're co-sponsoring this tech talk by Ge Wang. Um, I first learned of Ge Wang when I worked at Beatnik, which was a tiny company up in San Mateo that did uh, MIDI synthesizers for cell phones. And when we were in our final decline in the, the late 2000s, um, we watched in amazement as the iPhone was taking over the old uh, market that was formerly held by Symbian and Windows Mobile, which was kind of our bread and butter. And one of the things that we were really amazed by was the whole app phenomenon. And one of the um, companies that was really um, part of that whole initial app phenomenon was um, Smule, which is a, a audio uh, music and, and game company, which was co-founded by Ge Wang. Uh, I did apply there, and I didn't get in, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before, before uh, co-founding Smule, uh, Ge developed a, a very unusual programming language called Chuck, which I'm hoping he'll demonstrate today. And it has some bizarre operators uh, a couple that I really come to mind were one was called Upchuck, another one is called Spork. <laughs> and in addition to to uh, being the CTO at Smeal, got continues his research at Stanford at Karma CCRMA, uh, where he's an assistant professor. And in addition to that, he's a musician, of course. And you can find on YouTube a performance of his in one of his ensembles uh, playing. Stairway to Heaven on Oak Arena, and it's, it's both beautiful and crazy. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to introduce Ge Wang. Thank you very much, um, and thank you all for having me. Um, it's really a, a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I think I'll just jump right in with this slide, and uh, actually this is Karma, um, and this is... Uh, where I work as an assistant professor at Stanford. This is the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, CCRMA, pronounced Karma. And it's actually this uh, wonderful intersection of a lot of different disciplines around music, computing, technology, and design, um, combining everything from signal processing um, to music cognition and psychology to uh, computer science and, of course, music. And um, really finding sometimes very serendipitous and sometimes intention kind of intersections between all of those disciplines. Um, but jumping backwards in time a little bit, um, we uh, actually can ask the question, why computers for music? And there are, I think, a lot of reasons for that, among which um, is the precision of computers to actually, you know, once you have an algorithm to generate particular sound, you'll always have that sound, and then you can then malleably change, control, and use that sound creatively, musically, compositionally. Um, the other, of course, is the possibility for fantastical automation um, that computers and programming affords us. Um, in fact, this IBM 360 here is, um, um, is actually one of the machines that was used for, among many other things, actually sound synthesis. Of course, back in those days, it, it it was uh, the process of actually generating sound computer was a very painstaking one. You actually had to actually, you know, whatever the way the interface computer was, punch cards, whatnot, um, you had to actually painstakingly craft those. Um, by the way, this is before my programming time, so I'm, on, I'm kind of s just speculating as to what that process was like after hearing it from a lot of my colleagues. Um, and uh, if you're fortunate enough to actually have resources for, to compute, you would then basically enqueue your job to be processed in, you know, as a batch. Um, and maybe a week, two, three weeks later, you might get back analog tape that has been, you know, you know, DA converted from the digital synthesis to the sound. And when you hear that, you'd be like, that's not quite what I wanted. And then you got to start the process over again. So if you think about kind of the feedback cycle there, uh, it's days two weeks, potentially. Um, fast forwarding in time, um, and, uh, and this is actually a language that Glenn mentioned, it's, uh, it's the Chuck programming language. This is actually um, one of many different synthesis languages we have available for today's computers. Um, it's something that I worked on along with a lot of other wonderful folks at Princeton when I was a graduate student there. Um, and uh, rather than telling you about it, I'm, I'm just gonna show you um, using this thing called the mini article. 
This is an IDE for Chuck, um, and it's written by Spencer Salazar, who was uh, a fellow student uh, at Princeton. He's now uh, actually a graduate student at Stanford. And um, actually, we'll show you a blink buffer first. So Chuck, the name Chuck comes from the verb to throw, perhaps carelessly, to chuck something out there. So what I'm going to do here is actually instantiate a sign osc or a sign oscillator. I'm going to call it foo. That's our instance. I'm going to use this particular operator. That's the chuck operator. I'm going to chuck it to the DAC, which is uh, an abstraction for the sound output on this computer. So essentially, I've connected the output um, foo into the input of DAC. And this is kind of like a very textual way of like patching different audio synthesis modules. Um, and uh, this is actually a complete Chuck program. If I were to run this, Chuck is happy. Uh, we don't really know that except we saw the plus sign. That means Chuck is like, I understand more or less kind of what you want me to, well, I understand at least this is syntactically a correct Chuck program. And, um, but it doesn't really make a sound. So to make a sound, we actually have to deal with something very specific to Chuck, and that's this like, requirement for you to actually deal with time. So what I can then say here is two seconds, a duration, Chuck to the Chuckian now, which is a special keyword in Chuck that represents the current time. If I were to do this, and I hope this isn't too loud, it plays that sign tone for that duration. Um, and uh, so basically, um, the idea here is that Chuck is what we call kind of a strongly timed language, in which you actually have to um, really deal with time in order to make sound. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense since time and sound is such inextricably intertwined. Sound is a time-based medium. Um, so what we can do here then is can write a slightly more complicated program. I'm going to change the frequency of foo to 220 hertz. Actually, I think that's what it's defaulting to. I'm going to copy and paste this over three times in this straight line program. Change that, maybe change that to one second. So you can imagine what this would sound like. Right? So now we've generated those tones in sequence. Um, now let's add a little bit of control to this. In fact, I'm just going to loop. You actually don't have to indent and chuck, but I just, just for clarity, I'll do that. And if you do this, let's see, uh, let me actually make this a little smaller. Uh, the shortcut for that is not working, so. I'll just make the window bigger. You can all kind of guess as to what this would sound like. I hope you'll believe me when I say this will keep on going. Um, I can't really prove that. Um, so, okay, so let's do something else with this. Instead of hard coding these values, I'm actually gonna generate a random number between 30 and 1,000, and this is in hertz. And um, I'm going to set that to the frequency every, I don't know, Let's do 100 milliseconds. All right, so now what we've done is generate kind of the canonical computer music. This is, you know, the, the music that computers are supposed to make when they compute, I suppose. Um, but let's keep going. So what if we change the frequency randomly, not every 100 milliseconds, but every 10 milliseconds? What does that sound like? Sounds it's like, I always think of that as computer's version going blah, 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 blah. Um, And then, uh, let's keep going. What if we change every thousand times a second, we randomize the frequency on this sine wave? What does that sound like? It sounds like more of a texture. And I think part of the reason there is we actually cross this perceptual threshold where we stop perceiving these frequency changes as individual events, but rather now we hear more as of a continuum, more of a kind of a stationary texture. Um, let's keep going even more. What if we were to every digital sample change the frequency of this randomly within this range? What does that sound like? Does anyone, anyone know? Have you, care to guess? Um, if you're thinking noise, you're partly right. There's actually another component here, so let's go ahead and play this. Okay, there's definitely a noisy component, but you also heard that whistling sound. Um, it turns out the whistling sound is the frequency that's really at the average of the bounds of this uniform distribution. That's just something that happens when you actually 
are actually manipulating sound at this point. And, and I think the takeaway here is Chuck is a language that allows you to really zoom in into time and control audio synthesis at a very fine grain level. But then you can also zoom out. So that was one SAMP, which is duration of a digital sample. Uh, we can go in mil cell milliseconds, cell seconds. You know, you can control things at the granularity of minutes, hours, days, and even week. Yes, question. Oh, so um, the question was, uh, what's the sample rate? Uh, the sample right here can be, can be um, set to whatever you want. Right now, this is running a CD audio rate, which is 44.1K. Um, but you can change this to whatever sample rate you like. And then the duration of the sample is dependent on, of course, your sample rate. Whereas things like minute, week, these are actually you know, more according to real time. Um, this, probably, this particular program probably wouldn't be extremely exciting. Um, but it is something that you can do when you zoom out in time with Chuck. Uh, we kind of stop with week because month seems kind of challenging because you know, not all months are of the same duration exactly. Uh, someone did suggest Fortnite as, a, as another thing you can put in here, it's two weeks. Um, but we've, so far, we've just done week. But of course, you can construct your own durations in Chuck by simply just saying, you know, four week Chuck is my notion of a month. And then you can then turn around and use month as another dura unit of duration. And while this is a fairly simplistic um, way to think about kind of duration, it is a useful one in that it allows programmers, composers, sound artists to kind of define their own you know, frame of time and duration. So that's part of Chuck. Uh, the other part of Chuck is, you know, I guess the first part of Chuck, if it's kind of about this control over time, the next one is some notion of concurrency. And uh, I'll try to demonstrate here with three independent programs. Um, here is mode.ck, and by the way, .ck is the extension to Chuck files. Um, all this is is just an impulse generator going through a filter and we're sweeping that filter and it sounds something like this. Okay, so that's Mo. Larry sounds like this. It sounds exactly the same almost except we're actually emitting these impulses at slightly a faster rate. The other one's once every 100 milliseconds, this is once every 99 milliseconds. Um, then Curly just sounds a little bit different. He's going in 101 milliseconds, and also the range which we sweep the filter is different. So with these together, if we're to run them here, Chuck, Mo, Larry, and Curly at the same time, and by the way, I'm now using the command line version of Chuck. You can kind of hear them now phasing in and out of each other. And that's the other part of Chuck, is that it allows you to kind of create independent um, control flows and then just kind of throw them together. And because each of the control flows is already dealing with time, there's a module in Chuck that actually can very precisely schedule all of them. Um, in fact, in Chuck, in Chuck parlance, the, uh, each control is like a, it's called a shred. It's kind of like a thread, but it's non-printive. And it's basically um, controlled via time. And then the shreds are, shred, are scheduled by the Chuck scheduler. And the scheduler basically these jobs that can take all this information about time and put them together in a sample synchronous way. So what you end up with is a very precise um, way to talk about time and thereby, you know, to be able to talk about sound. Um, so um, one last thing I want to show you about Chuck um, is kind of a way of working with Chuck. And that's kind of this idea of like, um, well, computers are so fast, and by the way, Chuck, I, would, I think, is probably like the least efficient sound synthesis environment ever created. Um, and I, I, can, I think I, know, I can almost prove that. Um, I know in my heart that it is. Um, and uh, it's actually doing a lot of things that are inefficient. Um, but part of that is because to try to grant a certain level of flexibility and control uh, through code. Chuck gives us complete sample synchronous control. Um, over the sound synthesis parameters over time. And so basically you can change you know, anything whenever you want at whatever rate and the rate is completely dynamic. Um, but another thing it affords is this way of working which is you know, in contrast with like you know, 
mainframe computers and synthesizing sounds there, Chuck is meant to be very immediate. So Chuck is something that at least by design was trying to get people to experiment more kind of in the moment. So uh, we, we did this thing called um, on the fly programming. And I'll try to demonstrate with this simple program here. And all this is, if you take a quick look here, um, is just instantiates the same old sine oscillator connected to the DAC. We have an array um, of basically pitch offsets that we're going to use. Right now, there's just one element in it. We're going to randomly draw from this array, offset it into some register, and then convert that into a frequency and uh, do so every 200 milliseconds. So if you were to play this right now, it just generates the same tone because it's the only thing we have in our array. What I'm going to do is add a little major second here. I'm going to hit replace shred. So when you see that equal sign, it's actually like violently taking this piece of code out of the virtual machine and then shoving in another version to replace it. So um, if we're then to make this a little different in terms of the registers that can be offset into, you start getting these pitch classes but in different registers resulting in these um, potentially eight different pitches. Uh, let's keep adding to that. So add a major third. There we go. Perfect fifth. Let's make this a little faster. Uh, add a major sixth. And if you want, you can add a little reverb in here. Add a perfect uh, major seventh. Make it a little faster. Drop this to min to minor, and then so its idea here is that you can really experiment kind of in this in the zone, and you just want to just get this immediate feedback. And I think sometimes by granting this type of um, very immediate feedback, fundamentally can change the way we think about and you know work on audio programs. So, um, well, that in a nutshell is kind of the chuckling, which is a lot to it, and there's a lot of um, I kind of call them potholes. In the language, this is still a developing language, so there's like no less than like 2,000 disaster areas which will, you know, crash or thrash. I, I don't know, but uh, it is being used by a very active community, um, and uh, it is cross-platform open source. It will. I like to think of it as it will, it's just as likely to crash as well on pretty much any platform, um, and uh, it's actually something that's used in a few other things that I would like to talk about. Um, so that's Chuck. So one of the things Chuck was used in, um, and uh, this is one of the projects I was very fortunate to be a part of when I was at Princeton, is the Laptop Orchestra. This is the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. Um, this is started by my advisor, Perry Cook, and music professor at Princeton, Dan Truman. And, um, and the idea was that with a laptop orchestra, you pair people with laptops and also with if you can see, there's kind of this hemispherical, like, R2-D2 dome-like thing that's sitting next to uh, all the players, and that's a hemispherical speaker array. And the idea here is that with each instrument, can we actually make the sound more intimate and have its own kind of local presence, like uh, more traditional acoustic instruments. If, if I were to play, say, a violin up here, the sound doesn't actually go through a mixer and come out of the PA system. It comes from the artifact. And the idea here is that can we actually make computers, think of computers as instruments, but also make them sound more like a traditional, intimate, you know, chamber music instruments. So um, Dan actually coined the phrase, um, electronic chamber music is something that the laptop orchestra is, is meant to play, um, along with all its, you know, all the intimacy, the sonic intimacy that's associated with chamber music. And uh, this is actually a um, closer look at the speaker arrays, and this is from the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, so the Princeton one's called Plork. Um, and uh, after I started at Stanford, um, I felt we really needed a West Coast version of the Laptop Orchestra, and so Slork was then born. And, and um, I can give you a quick idea of how these um, speaker arrays in, uh, in Slork was created. So um, what we did was actually take IKEA salad bowls, uh, one of which you see is pictured here. Uh, it's an 11 inch IKEA Blanda mat for those of you that are interested in perhaps uh, building your own. The first step is to turn it upside down. It's a very crucial step. Then you drill holes in them. 
um, six holes per salable. Um, and then we've made base plates, routed them. We did a lot of um, different things to make them look nice. Um, and then uh, we took these four inch car speaker drivers, actually six of them per salable. And also we stack basically these stereo tamps. Um, so basically you actually have six channels of independently addressable sound. We basically made everything in like multiples of 20. Um, and uh, fortunately we had a wonderful group of students um, actually you know, design and uh, this together in 2007, 2008. Um, and then we you know, added laptops, we added multi-channel audio interfaces, we sit on meditation mats and pillows. This is kind of, um, we don't only do tables uh, or chairs right now because it seems like there's so many wires hang from behind the tables and this seems like a much more clean aesthetic. Um, here's an Ikea breakfast tray. This is what we put the laptop on. A lot of things of the orchestra comes from uh, Ikea. Uh, and. Uh, and then uh, we daisy chain some power together, and then we have like a wireless networking hub or switch. Um, we condition the powers. We have various audio interfaces as well as gaming interfaces that we use as music controllers. Um, you put that together, you get kind of you know this is one of 20 laptop orchestra stations. Um, and uh, on stage, we look something like this. This is the Stanford Laptop Orchestra playing with the Stanford New Ensemble playing traditional acoustic instruments um, and playing across uh, the Pacific with uh, musicians in Beijing um, in kind of a real-time network collaborative concert. Um, by the way, this is a research area that Chris Chafe, our director of Karma, um, has been working on for quite a few years to really connect different parts of the world to actually play music together um, over the high performance networks that we have today. And so this is kind of a coming together of several different research projects. Um, and we actually even, you know, we actually perform every, every year. There's a, there's a course um, in the spring at Stanford that is all about laptop orchestra. Um, in fact, there's a concert tonight at Karma, 7 p.m., um, that features the mobile phone orchestra and the laptop orchestra and is actually going to be having a, a several audience participation based uh, pieces. So definitely invite you to check that out. Immediately following that concert is the Karma Music Circus, which is um, a Karma wide concert, which essentially turned the whole building into a kind of a concert stage. We have just throughout the building all different kinds of installations and instruments and performances is going on. Just kind of walk around and experience. So that all starts at 7 tonight at Karma um, on campus at Stanford. So come check that out if I haven't fully deterred you from, from it yet. Um, so here we're just doing one last uh, SVN update um, outside of Karma before going into the sculpture gardens to perform one of these outdoor concerts that we did in 2008. In fact, um, one anecdote from that is we had to take the wireless networking hub and put it in high up in a tree because we're so spread out that it was, there was a lot of interference and so this is the one where we get direct line of sight between it and all the, all the machines that was trying to synchronize. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, it is a course at Stanford where we actually learn everything from coding to sound design to composition to, of course, performance. And we perform together as an ensemble. And again, we use Chuck as kind of our primary tool of teaching and using them to build instruments um, and sounds. So um, I think what I want to do is give you a quick demo now of, like, of some of the things that we use to actually build instruments. And uh, I'm going to switch over to the Wolf Vision for now. And um, actually, maybe the first thing I'll show you is um, if this works. This is an instrument that's based on just an accelerometer of the physical laptop. If I can lift this thing without wrecking it. Not an instrument. This is just a little demo. Um, the idea here is that we're using just sensors inside on the laptop to actually uh, control the sound synthesis. Um, I think of it as it's actually changing the vowel that is being uttered by this glottal pulses that we're hearing. I think of it as like gently grabbing someone by their throat and uh, molding their mouth um, to form the shapes that would you know utter these sounds. Um, 
and actually anytime you have accelerometers uh, for tilt sensing, you also have what we call smack sensing. Um, by the way, this is research that a uh, fellow graduate student at the time, Rebecca Fiebrink, um, who's actually gave a Google Tech Talk not long ago here on her work on real-time machine learning for music. Um, she's going to be actually a professor at Princeton in this coming fall. She and I did this research in actually converting the physical laptop as a platform for making laptop orchestra instruments. And uh, we did this smack sensing using the accelerometer, and this is another demo. Um, do, do. So this just senses basically do, 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 do. Um, yeah, so uh, it's trying to it's trying to take kind of the experience a little bit outside of the screen and the mouse and the UI of the laptop and thinking of it more as a physical thing. Um, on the tails of that is then this kind of instrument that Rebecca and I created um, called Joy of Chant uh, for a piece of the same name, and that uses um, this joystick. And if things work, let's see. There we go. All right. So how this works is when you squeeze the trigger here, it starts singing. Now that's not going to fool anyone. That's not like a you know real person singing. That's that's a computer generated you know singing voice. But it is generated. It's actually not recorded. It's actually completely you know just out of numbers the way I actually compute in here. Um, all right. So how does this instrument work? So by tilting it to one corner. Versus another, you get different vowels. And then when you move, you get kind of a smooth interpolation between those vowels. Um, and then you get things like volume control. And, uh, and because this is a model, we can kind of break it down into its components, component parts. Instead of kind of this pitched glottal train, glottal pulse train that's generating what we think of as pitch, we can send noise through this model and make it breathe. Okay. And then you can map it to the keyboard to make it you know, sing a little bit. So I just typed the keys Z, C, B, A, D, G, W, E. And uh, it's kind of laid out like the uh, like fretboard of a, of a guitar. And uh, you can make it sing really low. Or really high. And by the way, if you twist it, you got vibrato, so. Um, and then, if you want, you can play little ditties with this. So that's that's the joy of chant, and that's just one of, I think, to date, more than 200 instruments and pieces that have been created for the laptop orchestra. Um, so moving on, um, there's this quote that I've since really taken to heart um, about computing, and this is by the HCI researcher Ben Schneiderman, who said, the old computing is about what computers can do, whereas the new computing is about what people can do. And I think that is a theme that you know, really is um, very relevant to you know, pretty much everything we, we, we might do with computing today. And certainly for music, which is, of course, of primary interest um, to us um, when we think about computer music. Um, with that in mind, um, We go to this thing, and this, of course, is the iPhone. Um, and um, before working on the iPhone, we actually worked with kind of the first mobile phone orchestra at Stanford, um, and we're actually using um, Nokia devices running on Symbian. Um, and working on that, I think, was the first realization that I had that wow, these these mobile phones are getting so powerful. They're you know, in terms of computation, but then they also have all this like sensors you can use, accelerometers, now multi-touch, gyroscope, um, but then they're also really connected, and also they're really, really personal. Um, you know, these devices are all but invisible. They're just, you know, you kind of don't notice them, um, and there's something that we have with us, you know, that you can put, you slip into your pocket, you can use while you're waiting to get milk at this convenience store. It's just something that is so, like, in the moment, um, and thereby so intimate. So um, that was, that's when I really, really wanted to you know, see what we can do 
with this kind of device for music and for sound. Um, and so when the iPhone SDK was announced in the spring of 2008, um, we decided to, well, in a, I think in a bout of insanity to actually you know, start a company um, to really kind of leverage the things we're, we've learned and continue to learn in the research side at Karma and elsewhere in computer music and apply it to actually kind of the startup where we can build products that can reach a critical mass of people to actually learn more about what we can do with mobile devices. So there, you know, it was through that process that Smule was, uh, was kind of born. So um, I'm gonna give you a few demos here to, to kind of show you some of the earlier products we did. Um, the first product we did was actually a thing called Sonic Lighter. And it's not a musical instrument, it's a, it's a lighter. Uh, but it is sonic in nature. So I'm gonna hopefully show you that here. So uh, basically, you know, kind of when you first open it, it's, it's nothing more than just an, yet another virtual lighter for, for your phone, of which there are like dozens and dozens. Um, but, uh, you know, this one, the idea is that you, it will respond to accelerometer, will respond to touch, and by the way, the accelerometer, the whole idea is that, you know, you should be able to hold this up at concerts and uh, um, you use your phone, which people are actually doing these days. They just use, like, the brightness of their screen to be their concert lighter. Um, you can, of course, pinch, um, this to give the flame different sizes. But then this is where I think the similarities maybe stop a bit. We try to make some statement with this. Aesthetically, we try to say that this is not a simulation of a lighter on your phone. Your phone is the lighter. And we try to prove that by, uh, you know, having you tilt the phone. And actually here, you can't really hear it here. Let me see if I can. There's this kind of unnerving crackling sound. That's the sound of the flame burning the side of your phone. Um, <laughs> And uh, there's yet another kind of a gesture that you can do here, um, which is uh, you can actually blow out the flame by blowing into the phone. So there we go. So what I'm actually doing is, of course, blow into the microphone here. And there's a little check program inside the sonic lighter that's tracking basically the amplitude of that signal. And then when it gets above a certain threshold, it starts wavering above another threshold says, oh, this is sufficiently strong, I'm just gonna extinguish myself. Um, and then uh, there's another thing you can do here, which is um, given two lighters, you can actually put one into flamethrower mode <laughs> and light the other one. So let me show you that again. And this is, this is done also through sound. Okay. So there's actually emitting a very faint signal from one of the phones. It's, uh, it, and then this other one is basically looking for exactly that signal or something close to it. Once it detects enough of it, it said, oh, someone's trying to ignite me, I'm going to burst into flames. And, uh, and that's kind of the way that this works. And then there's um, another aspect to this, which is kind of a s social test. And uh, so on this globe visualization, not unlike Google Earth. Um, well, it's, it's a very pared down version of Google Earth because the zoom level kind of stops here. But anyway, um, you can see all these um, <laughs> points of light. Um, and those are where people have recently ignited their sonic lighters from around the world. Um, and um, this is just a social experiment, but it ended up being kind of something we put into every subsequent product we've ever released at Smule. And you can actually see uh, the first six days and seven days of, you know, kind of sonic lighter, and the world was just like lighting up. Um, it was kind of fun. It was also uncanny how much this image matches images of the Earth, you know, is taken from satellite images, you know, from space and night. Um, speaking perhaps to population densities as well as perhaps to um, maybe distribution of wealth. Because, you know, this is meant to be kind of provide that tinge of connection between people who have the sonic lighter. It's like seeing this globe, you know, we wonder if it's, is it like, you know, there are other people out there like me who have bought a virtual lighter for 99 cents on their iPhone. And somehow that's connecting us in some small way. Um, any case, um, so what that brings me to is another favorite quote, and I think this is one that's so timeless, and uh, undoubtedly some of you um, 
I've also seen this, and that says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, from Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and so it's, I think we're, in, through technology, you know, we're not really magicians, but we do try to build sufficiently advanced technology through, with music. And one of the things we try to do on the tales of Sonic Glider was actually build an instrument um, called ocarina. And, um, and this is a, meant to be kind of an ancient flute-like instrument kind of reimagined for the iPhone. And again, using you know, everything that we could possibly use on the iPhone. Um, and, uh, and so if you look at kind of the design of ocarina, it, it, you know, it was kind of this exercise in design that was inside out, it was backwards. It wasn't like we, we said, we want to build X, and let's see how to make it work on an iPhone. It was, OK, here's an iPhone. What is it good for? What are its limitations? And can we find something that really fits that profile? Um, so it's kind of this inside out design. I'll try to play a little ditty for you on the ocarina to, to demonstrate. Um, I'm going to put on these. Uh, Speaker gloves, this is actually from the Stanford Mobile Phone Orchestra. We actually just took these gloves, chopped off the fingers of the gloves, uh, actually sewn on these kind of um, portable speakers that are battery powered. And uh, we added a splitter here, so you can just basically still have your fingers to manipulate the phone, but you get this mobile amplification, much like kind of the intimate sound that you get from uh, the laptop orchestra. And hopefully this will work. I'm going to fire up Ocarina. Um, it looks something like that. And you just press down. It uses multi-touch um, to actually let you hold down different combinations on the finger hole. And then you can blow into this. So uh, if I were to try playing this, a little louder. So that's pretty much the whole idea. Um, so, and and uh, the accelerometer is used to actually map the sound's vibrato. So if I play like this versus you immediately get that little extra boost of uh, instantly just, just add water type of expressiveness um, to it. All you have to do is tilt it. And with this, you can play you know, a number of ditties. Um, I always end up playing the Zelda theme because this is kind of what inspired this instrument. This is just, because it's just some, a game that we love so much. Um. For example. Um, so, um, and this is an instrument that you know we really want want people just to pick up um, and start playing. And to help them with that, we actually have a number of uh, um, ocarina establishers on our website uh, to help people get started. And more than that, there's the same social feature in ocarina that actually shows you what other people are actually playing at their current locations around the world. So let's see if we can tune in. To Someone calling themselves Lawless. <laughs> Sounds like a... Sounds like a very, um, yeah, a very nice rendition of uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star with some artistic license thrown in there. Um, very nice. And you can see this is just literally going all across the world. Um, it's like. For the first week that we launched Ocarina, um, the, the song that was like going all that was like all around the world happened to be Amazing Grace. That kind of became the like, you know, um, stairway to heaven of Ocarina. You know, if it's like, if you go in guitar shops and say no stairway, it's like, you know, this one, it was, I think there was a moment when everyone's like, no more Amazing Grace. It was because it was actually one of the few um, kind of tablature we had on our website. Since then, users have generated more than, I think, like 3,000 different 
tablatures for Ocarina. And so now you can play, you know, a very large, uh, choose from a large repertoire um, of music. So uh, that's a little bit about the Ocarina. Um, and if you look at kind of the user community behind it, um, if you just did a search on YouTube for Mule Ocarina or iPhone Ocarina, you found hundreds if not thousands of user videos that are just performing for the world on their iPhone. Um, and again, this is kind of the tablet, what the tablet looks like. It's kind of like a game. You just have to follow along. Blue circle means you hold it down. White circle means um, you, you don't. And then the arrows mean you basically hold that note for a little longer than the other one. So if you know what the melody kind of sounds like, you have a chance of just picking this up and playing it within, I don't know, like 10 seconds. Um, so to demonstrate, I'll also show you, uh, we actually held a contest called This Contest Blows Ocarina Contest. <laughs> Um, we try to, you know, basically find the top YouTube performances of, of Ocarina players. So this is one of our winners. You can actually see her eyes. I don't know if you caught it. She's actually scanning something, and uh, presumably, probably, it's the score to this on her computer. So, in some sense, like the computer monitor has become kind of like, you know, from Ocarina, kind of the modern-day music stand, um, and the Ocarina has become some kind of like a recorder. It's kind of your, you know, it could be your first instrument that you learn how to play, and it's really that easy. Here's just one, another one of our winners um, doing something very unexpected. This is why I love the iPhone. So she is playing music of the night through her nose on, on the ocarina. Um, and apparently she's been a nose flautist for like all her life. And this is just the most recent nose flute that she has had you know, to uh, play with. Uh, she actually recently appeared on The Ellen Show uh, playing nose flute. So uh, we're very happy that she did this. She, along with our other I think 14 winners, each received $1,000. And, and a Smule t-shirt for her, we send her also a box of Kleenex, um, just for her troubles. Another anecdote here, um, and this is with Sonic Glider. We actually had, like, um, we actually had uh, this integration um, using Google Maps where we actually showed where all the, you know, basically at different times where all the people have lit up uh, on their Sonic Gliders. And then one day we got an email from a user who said, hey, check out this location. And we started zooming in. And you kind of start seeing this pattern emerging. <laughs> and uh, so one of our users actually left us a message. And uh, we verified in our database there's actually one device uh, that did this. And they, you know, this is pretty much the easiest way to do this is probably not to hack into our servers, but rather just walk down the street, light up the sonic lighter, blow it out, walk a few more steps, and do it again until you've constructed this message. Um, so, uh, okay, so. That brings us to kind of another instrument and another experience, and this is called Leaf Trombone World Stage. And this is actually to take Ocarina, um, add some gaming elements to it, so you can kind of on the right side, you see kind of these like, well, you don't really see, you see this uh, leaves um, flying towards these markers, and you're meant to be kind of opening the trombone slide to that location while blowing into the phone. So it's like kind of a trombone hero of sorts. But then there's also, um, a composer where users can actually create content today. More than 6,000 leaf trombone tracks have been created by our users. And then you can actually do this thing on the world stage um, for what we call kind of this like crowdsourced judging of leaf trombone performances. And uh, it looks something like this, but maybe the best way is just to sh show you. Um, there's going to be a loud pop. I'm going to swap audio here, so uh, cover your ears a little bit. Okay, and uh, I'm going to fire up the world stage here on the leaf trombone. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Oops. 
her favorite. Let's do that one. So what the app is doing is actually um, recruiting judges from, from the pool of users. Um, so when someone actually submits a performance to the world stage, the app goes out and finds three judges to, to in real time, relative to each other, judge the performance. So we're about to observe this particular judging session. So you can use emoticons to uh, show your support. There's a sonic ladder being waved there. Um, you can also put text messages here. Um, wow, everyone's got their ladders out now. It's really you know that kind of a performance and that kind of a song. And so the idea here is that we can, even if you don't speak the same language, you can actually use emoticons. And sometimes you can get too excited. And here we had, we had to, I think, I guess the system had to censor this particular user. Um, but we imagine it was a message of support. <laughs> and at the very end uh, of a performance, um, you actually get um, a rating between 1 to 10. And this is a way to really give feedback uh, back to the performer. <laughs> Everyone's rocking out. All right, so that's pretty high scores. And the idea here is that, I mean, well, it's, it's really hard for computers to actually gauge what a good performance is, especially on the leaf trombone. You know, some things are, some things are so inherently difficult for computers to capture, like if a performance is funny or sad or, you know, failed spectacularly but is still awesome for some reason. Like the notion of awesome is kind of hard to capture for computers, that, as, as far as I know, today. Um, so this is a way to kind of use computers to set the conditions right for people to then, you know, of course, compute their human computation cycles to this process. Um, so uh, it's basically research problems like this that, you know, for which we actually formed kind of the mobile phone orchestra at Stanford, um, and actually where we actually do research not only locally but also uh, at a wide scale, and, and the, you know everything kind of somehow shrinks to like a five-letter acronym or like a name, you know, like Chuck, Karma, Slork, Plork, Smule. In this case, Mofo, the PH. That's a mobile phone orchestra. Um, and we're of course we use these type of um, hand-mounted speakers, and we perform like the laptop orchestra, but also we take kind of the location awareness of these devices and the distribution of these devices in the critical mass. Um, and to you know, ask different kind of research questions that we might try to solve um, since these devices are so ingrained into our everyday lives. And so that's you know, just a little bit about the mobile phone orchestra. Um, now for something completely different. Um, this is T-Pain. And um, it, before we actually ended up like, talking to T-Pain about making an app together, which we ended up doing, uh, he turned out to be like a sonic lighter user. And here's like a picture of him blowing out the lighter. Um, and uh, he was really happy, apparently, about being able to do that. And uh, sometime later, kind of independently of this incident, um, we actually got together and, and talked about making an app together. Um, in fact, it was actually one of the few times, like, we usually come up with our own concept and ideas that we develop. This time it was T-Pain and Nappy Boy and said, hey, I have an idea. Let's just put auto-tune on the iPhone. And so you just turn your iPhone into this auto-tune mic. That's all you got to do. And for us, it really fit because what we told T-Pain was that you know, we want to build an app for you um, that really kind of captures some essential part of your, who you are as an artist. And we didn't want to build yet another kind of a fan app for you. We want to build something that really kind of captured some part of you know, your, your essence as an artist. So it kind of really fit to actually put his music along with auto-tune on on the iPhone, and what came out was actually I am T-Pain. And this idea was to really transform every user into T-Pain. And uh, at the risk of embarrassing myself, uh, or to embarrass myself further, I will, uh, I'll, I'll sing a little ditty for you. I'm gonna, there's gonna be another audio pop as I unplug this. 
Ooh, okay, here we go. Let's see, does this work? Check, check. check. Yeah, yeah. Turn off the... I'm gonna turn off that microphone there. Yeah, 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 whoa, whoa. Okay, so that's a little bit auto-tune. <laughs> Apologies in advance. Shawty! What's your name? Let me talk to you. Let me buy you a drink. I'm T Pain. So you get the idea. Um, so I a little bit more because because the connector's a little bad. Show you how I live. Let's get drunk. Forget what we did. Can I buy you a drink? Oh whoa. So, anyway, you get the idea. I'll just uh, I'll stop. So that's I am T Pain, and uh, today, like, uh, like two million people have like downloaded this and are, are auto tuning, you know, not only to T Pain's music, but through this thing, through this technique that T Pain has really taken to an illogical extreme, um, auto tuning their life. Um, so everything from like I don't know their cat, their babies, uh, whatever they can find, they've been auto tuning, and also they've been taking some of the tracks that we've bundled with this that um, T Pain has released. Um, and they're actually doing this kind of stream consciousness, like kind of like talking about their life in rap, in auto tune. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so onwards, uh, Magic Piano. This is another application. It's actually the first application we built for the iPad. And this is something we did in early of this year, in early earlier this year. And it started actually with uh, Long Long. Um, who pictured here is the pianist who played in front of like five billion people at the Summer Olympics opening ceremony. Um, he's one of the you know, most renowned pianists today. And uh, we actually met in 2009. Magically, like a month later, the iPad was announced and said, hey, here's a large multi-touch device that you can use. And suddenly, you know, the piano that we were planning on doing made a lot more sense. So out came Magic Piano. And within, you know, a month of release, people were playing it, cats were playing it. Uh, this is a viral video that got like six million views. Uh, and it was just like the cat playing the Magic Piano and this other app called Noby Noby Boy. And apparently cats really like iPads. And so do babies. And so, so uh, I'll, maybe I'll give you a demo of, of that as well. How am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. I th I think I'll I'm almost through, but uh, if you if you need to run, feel free to to escape. Okay. If you need to escape, please do so. Uh, if, um, I'll just keep going for now. Wow, it's a really dirty screen. Whoops. I forgot that was actually live. Okay. We'll just uh, live with this dirty screen for now. I can turn off the lights, maybe. <laughs> there we go. That's a little better. So this first mode is just kind of like an invisible keyboard. Absolutely impossible to play anything on. Um, this is almost as difficult to play on, um, but it looks kind of cool. And uh, that was kind of like 50% of the reason for doing this. And then, and in this mode, you can actually hope to play something on if you want. Um, and then you have various different modes. Now, this is actually not the things people are doing on the Magic Panel. These are just kind of like um, little toys. But then people are well, they're really playing on the Magic Panel is the songbook. And uh, let me see if I can play something for you here. It's a little Claire de Lune. And the timing's completely up to you.
So, and this is kind of something that just kind of, it's not scored, it's not meant to be scored, it's just, it, it doesn't try to judge you at all about kind of like playing this, and it's completely up to you how you want to play the song. Um, I wish maybe I'd show you another one that has more of a multi-touch on here. so on and so forth. So that's kind of the magic piano. It also had this duet mode, which is probably not gonna work right now. It depends on how many other people are also trying to duet over the magic piano. But this actually randomly finds another person. Whoa, okay. So that's actually a real person somewhere out there right now playing something. And uh, let me try to, and uh, I think if nothing else, you can play some heart and soul on this, but I don't think I can get this person interested. He seems to be interested in this more like free form. Sometimes they respond. So um, <laughs> anyway, that's another social experiment where we're trying to say, okay, this is kind of like a piano roulette thing where you just kind of like pair people up a minute at a time and then let them play together. And uh, you know, if they like playing with each other, they can like you know have requests for more time. So that's that's the magic piano. Um, I have two more things to show you. Then I'll try to do them quickly. Glee. This is a, another app where we try to introduce kind of a collaborative singing into, kind of a social singing into this. So the first thing you can do with Glee, I'm gonna unplug, is to uh, use it kind of like um, a harmonizer. So, so I can open up Glee here and get it to work. Check, check. So that basically takes my voice and chops it up into all these little tiny sound greens, and then it basically puts them back together at different pitches, but it's still my voice. So it's basically this like just add water type of auto harmonization. There's some rules we built into this thing. There's a person calling themselves Amadeus um, that's now playing on the magic piano over here. As uh, they just connected while I was just talking. And Amadeus is playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. So uh, let me um, let me start over. So basically, this is meant to be uh, just constantly auto harmonizing with you. So you can sing um, from the TV show. And then what you can do is once you've, you've, you've sung, sing the song, then you can actually go to the world and listen to other people sing. But if you hear anything you like, you can then choose to add your voice to that particular performance. Today, we have performances on the globe which have had like dozens um, of performers, like John Lennon's Imagine, for example. There's a rendition with like 60 people on it from all over the world. It's kind of haunting and a little creepy, but like, <laughs> infinitely awesome that people are doing this. And then uh, just completely not by our own doing, people have self-organized to get like a world version of We Are the World um, into the Glee Globe and just to try to get as many people as they can seeing on this. So that's Glee. And really, if you look at all the different components of it, it's really kind of, you know, on the client, it does pitch correction, harmonization, visualization. And then basically in the cloud, it allows you to share and uh, sing together on this thing. And the final thing I want to show you is actually an application we just released um, last week, I guess. Um, that's the Magic Fiddle. Um, it looks kind of like this. It's kind of a game, but it's also a way to teach you how to play a fiddle of sorts. Um, and uh, it actually is an instrument that we like to think is like 
it talks to you. It's if you ma can imagine like HAL 9000 from 2001, like you know, kind of appearing in the form of a magic fiddle and you know trying to help you to learn the, how to play the magic fiddle. That's pretty much what the experience is like. So the first thing you actually see on this app is it says, "Hello, I am your fiddle. Let's play music together." So um, I will attempt to play a little for you. That other speaker is running out of battery, so I'm going to just swap it into this one. Maybe if I can. Ah. Okay, that more or less works. Plug this into the iPad. This is kind of like. Well, the original, uh, how this app came about in concept was that it was like, we're actually walking out of a concert that Long Long was playing with the San Francisco Symphony, and it started as a joke. We're like, we had our iPads with us, we're like, it would be like totally absurd if you had an app, like a violin, that you had to actually hold up to your face to play, and it just seemed like such a ridiculous idea that we had to go ahead and do it. Um, so this is kind of the, the violin. And you can do vibrato on this, you can do plucks. The tuning is really low. Let me actually set this to something more sane. And then we thought this actually was going to be a pretty hard instrument for people to just pick up and play. It turned out to be actually people just, just kind of do it. Um, but we actually made like, you know, the storybook, which is basically two books of four chapters each that teaches all the different techniques from like how to hold your iPad properly to play the magic fiddle to how to playing, you know, Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then you can go into songbook and basically play this in kind of a, like a rock band guitar hero like thing. So let me try to play a little bit for you. The, the magic fiddle. And that's kind of the latest thing. And it's kind of just trying to, you know, if there's a concept that's uniting a lot of these different experiences between what we're doing in Karma and Smuel, one of them is just trying to set the conditions right through technology to get people to experience the joy of making music. And, you know, it, it shouldn't, I think we've gone to a point where it's like, it feels like making music is reserved for like musicians or composers or you know, people who actually decide to do that for, for a living. No, I think making music should probably, you know, at least to start making music, shouldn't be any harder than, say, picking up your phone and calling your best friend. And so um, I think that's one area of the research that we're really, you know, working on. And, uh, yeah, if you go on YouTube, you also find, like, the St. Lawrence String Quartet actually playing um, Pachelbel's Canon in D uh, with iPads. 
um, I won't have time to show you this here, but if you just look for um, iPad violin, then you have it. So to wrap up, um, just some things that we've we thought about as we're doing this, you know, if you look at phones versus computers, laptops or desktops, they're roughly equivalent now, you know, like the same basic components. You have display, you have sound, you have computation, you have networking, um, but you just have less of that on the phone. You just have less of everything. Smaller screen real estate, less powerful CPU, less cycles, less memory, etc. But in some real sense, phones are more, more powerful because of the very kind of personal nature that they bring. Um, the things that you would want to do on a phone that you would never want to do on a computer, and vice versa. So I think at the end of the day, it just feels like they're just fundamentally different. And from a design and thinking point of view, it really, they really deserve to kind of be their own kind of a blank slate, if you will, when you actually, when, certainly when we think about designing things for this. And the other way to think about this is almost like, you know, as we're making more of these experiences for people to play music, it just feels like in, this, in the same way that well, if you think about computers and desktop computers, when we go use it, we kind of go to it. We immerse ourselves in its world, in its screen. We kind of sit down at our computer and we focus on it. But for mobile devices, it's like bringing computation out into our everyday lives. Um, and that's something that is really significant, something that I think certainly for music has huge potential that have yet to be unlocked. So. I'll leave you with another quote, since I love these quotes. Um, and this is by, of course, uh, the, the late Mark Weiser, um, one of the fathers of ubiquitous computing, who said, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the very fabric of everyday life. And I think, you know, as far as mobile goes, it's certainly for music, this is, is just prophetic and all too true, and becoming even more true as, as time goes on. And so I guess with this, I just want to thank you and for having me and uh, for letting me torture you with my various um, performances. Um, thank you very much.